I think that you guys will um, will have heard something of this before in little patches, but I do put it together like this before. All right. Tale of Two Cities. The reason I call it this is because in the Bible there is a uh, a story flowing through the Bible from start to finish that, in a way, tracks or divides the world into two camps. One is the city of Jerusalem, and one is the city of Babylon. Right? So at different times we may have covered Babylon, we may have covered Jerusalem, but when you look at the two stories together in parallel, it sort of makes it even more uh, obvious that this is underpinning a lot of the scriptures and tells us where we're going and where we've been. Here's a famous book by Charles Dickens, which this is not about, but when, when you talk about two cities, Tale of Two Cities, this is about France and London, oh, sorry, Paris and London, uh, whereas what we're talking about is Babylon and Jerusalem. Firstly, we want to look at Babylon. Now, do we all know the, the history of the city of Babylon, roughly? Babylon was one of the biggest, grandest cities on earth. It was massive. We're talking about a city that was over a million people back in the times when most people had a village of maybe a couple of hundred, right? This is a massive city. The walls were 30 stories high, and the width of the walls, you could, you could park six semi-trailers across. So we're talking a massive city that was uh, pretty much uh, impregnable. It was just completely... Uh, fortified. The towers where the, the archers would sit was another about 10 stories higher than the actual walls. So any invading army couldn't even fire their weapons to the archers that were up on the walls. They were too high. So it makes what we sort of see in the movies nowadays about these big cities like Lord of the Rings, that is peanuts, that is nothing. These walls were so big and strong that no battering ram, no explosive, nothing would have got through these walls. They were massive. Right. So, this city was huge. Now, we read in Proverbs chapter 18, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run into it, and is, uh, and is safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, and has a high wall in its conceit. And, um, this, uh, this scripture, the whole of this chapter, is really talking about the pride of mankind, right? And mankind, the, the concept of a city, when you think about it, is for your protection and your refuge and your safety. And so, in the Bible, the concept of living in a city is about having a city to protect you. So, as we look at this concept as we go through and see where Babylon actually came from. There's a really interesting un uh, story that underpins it. The other city, obviously, is Jerusalem, which, on the other side of the coin, means city of peace. And it represents the unified body of God's children. Whereas the other one, which means confusion, is really anything other than that. So there is no other middle ground. The way the Bible puts it is you are either God's people or you are part of the other city. There's no third option. So you may not consciously decide that you I want to be part of Babylon, but a, but a failure to be part of the city of Jerusalem means that you are automatically part of Babylon. And people don't realise that. Just going through quickly the origin of Babylon. In the book of Genesis and late in the book of Revelation, we read about the city of Babylon. Genesis uses the Hebrew name Babel or Babel, whereas the New Testament Greek word is Babylon. So it's the same. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you talk about um, in, in the book of Revelation, the term is used Babylon the Great. Right? The word great just means tower. So when you talk about this, the Tower of Babel, the Hebrew word for Tower of Babel really just means Babylon the Great. That's all it means. So the Tower of Babel story, which is found in Genesis chapter 11, is really 
an important uh, understanding to get in the scriptures about how it relates to Babylon. Because Babylon is mentioned all through scripture. In Genesis chapter 11, you see, you read about the Tower of Babel. Isaiah 13 and 4, you mentioned Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7. Uh, Jeremiah 50 and 51. <coughs> and then, of course, in the Revelations as well. Oops, excuse me. <coughs> so, to, to really understand it, we want to go right back to the beginning and just go through the story of Genesis because there's a lot in this story about this city. Chapter 2 and verse 15 we read, And the Lord God took the man, this is talking about Adam, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. Now, um... This is a really interesting part of it. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the decision to eat of that tree is, um, is really like, like I've written down here in the black uh, border. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is to claim that mankind is able to discern the difference between good and evil and to choose to do good. This is the philosophy that underpins ethical humanism. Now what I mean by that is that when Eve was told not to eat of, Adam was told not to eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. The decision to go and eat that fruit proposes a concept that mankind is able to go and eat of this, this, of this knowledge of good and evil to make a distinction between right and wrong and to choose to do good, which is what God was proposing that mankind is not capable of doing. Right? Do we see that? that philosophy that underpins it, right? So, God had to then set about teaching mankind that they are not able to cope with the knowledge of good and evil and to discern the difference and to then be able to choose to do good by their own volition. We don't have that capability. Our nature will always choose to do uh, whatever we want to do. I was listening to a guy during the week talking about the Satanic Bible. Do you know there's a Satanic Bible? And there's a Satanic to uh, Top Ten. <laughs> Ten Commandments. And the first commandment is, do what thou wilt. In other words, do your own thing. And that's really the concept of ethical humanism. We choose our own, our own destiny. So, that's the proposition that was happening there in the garden. Do we all follow that concept? What you find in the Bible is Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 are really foundational to the rest of the book. So a lot of the stories that we read in the scriptures and all the concepts are, if you like, compressed into those few chapters. So if you picture it, Adam and Eve, Adam formed in the garden, then Eve is formed as a helpmeet, and they eat of this fruit, they're, they're tricked into eating this fruit by Satan. Read here chapter 3. Then, once they're tricked into it, then it sort of sets the course for mankind. You know, the New Testament says that sin entered the world through these events here in Genesis. So in chapter 3, and verse 5, we read this. For God does know, this is what Satan is saying to Eve. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Isn't it interesting here that she noted that it made her wise? See, what's, what happens, what I find in the religious world, is that people are basing their religious belief on their own ability to rationalise all of the information. Right? That's what happened. People, and, and in, in, to some extent we all do it, is that we make decisions based on their relationship with God 
based wholly on our own intellectual ability to discern, discern what the scriptures say and whatever, right? So you've got all these different religious ideologies out there, whether they're Muslim or Buddhist or whatever, that all are all theoretical. We should not be like that. We should be able to look into the scriptures and back up what we're saying with the scriptures. But the fundamental basis on which our, our church stands is on the infilling of the Holy Ghost, an experience with Jesus. That's got to underpin our belief. You take that away and all we have is a theory that's based on our own intellect. That's, that's what God, is, I think, is getting at with all of this. Not doing things... God is not happy to accept anything that we do. We've got to somehow make sure that what we're doing is, what, is what, exactly what God told us we should be doing. It's no good us just having our own approaches and coming to him and thinking he'll be happy with that. Because that's what we're going to see with this story. What happened then was the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now what, what's happening here is they have sinned against God and then they're trying to cover themselves with fig leaves or fruit of the vine. We read that and it's like a little funny thing, you know, you sort of picture it, these two naked people there and you've got these little fig, fig leaves, you know. There's a lot in that statement. They are proposing to be able to cover themselves, give themselves a covering. Can't be done. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, uh, Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? Now hands up anybody who thinks that God didn't know where he was. Yeah, of course God knew where Adam was, but he's asking him where he is, right? And he said... I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? God knew all this happened, right? But he wants Adam to admit it, that, he, that he'd eaten of the tree, because he knew he wasn't supposed to, right? So they done the wrong thing. They sinned, and then they set about to cover it up with their own ideas. That's what the concept is. So the fig leaf represents mankind trying to cover themselves with their own religious concepts. That's what it represents. Because straight after this, just from the scripture here, we read in Revelation 2, I'll quote this to you. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and uh, rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that you may see. This is a letter to the Laodicean church saying to them that he wants us, we need to have a covering that he provides. See, God will cover us. He wants to, to cover our sin, but we can't do it ourselves. That's what the concept that God is trying to portray through these early chapters of Genesis. And unto Adam also and to his wife uh, did the Lord make coats of skin and clothe them and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now let him put forth his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he's, God is going to kick them out of the garden then. But notice here that God provided a covering that he provides. His own covering. It's important because we're going to see that with Cain and Abel, the same concept reiterated again. Therefore the Lord God sent, them, sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of, Eden, uh, east of the garden of Eden cherubims a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. In other words, the word of God is protecting the tree of life. And the only way for us to be able to come and partake of that tree of life is through the word of God. That's what, the, that's what the swords represent. 
In fact, if you want to get right into the, the flame of cherubims, it actually took, speaks more about being born of the water and the spirit. You know what Jesus said to the woman of the well? You must be God of the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The spirit is the Holy Ghost and fire and the word is the sword, the sword of the spirit. So the word of God and the spirit must come together in order for us to be able to get back into the tree of life. That's what's the, and that same thing is stopping people from coming back in. Do we see that? That's why God put a flaming sword at the, at the gate. It represents that, that the Word of God and the Spirit will keep more people out of the Kingdom of God than it will lead in. Chapter 4. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Now Cain means possession or fruits of labour. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, and she again bore his brother Abel, which means a baker. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock, and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. Now, does this seem fair to you? God, they both present an offering to God, and God accepts Abel's, but he doesn't accept Cain's. When I first read this, I thought, that doesn't sound terribly fair. But when you think about this, Cain and Abel knew and should have learned the lesson of their parents, in that they came with a covering that was of the fruit of the, of the, fruit of the ground, fig leaves, and God's covering was of the, of the land, the skins. Do we see that, that concept being portrayed there? So, in other words, Cain's offering represents what we can do for God. It's not about works. It's not about us trying to please God by doing things for Him. He doesn't need our help. He's God. <laughs> you know? This concept, this concept of doing and being saved by works and doing something for God is the concept of ethical humanism. Somehow, the eternal will be impressed if we behave in a certain way. So, this culture is what we're born into. So, it comes into the church and somehow we get the idea that if we be good, we're going to go to heaven. We're going to be accepted before God. That's not what it's about. If we love the Lord, we will by nature do the things that are contained in the law. So we'll be what the Bible terms as good, righteous people if we love the Lord and follow Him. But we're not do that, that's not the way in which we be. We're not saved by that. We're saved by grace. Do you understand the distinction there, the concept? If we love the Lord, you don't want to be separated from the Lord. Because we know that sin separates us from God. So... Our love for the Lord, now just our simple desire to just be pleasing in His sight, it's distinctly different from thinking somehow if I legalistically structure my life so that I'm doing things religiously to try and please God. That's what Cain was offering. The work of his hands. Look, both of these guys work. Now, this guy here is a farmer, and this guy here is a shepherd. Now, shepherding is hard work, but farming is harder work. Farming is hard work. And he's offered the work of his hands. And it's unacceptable. God is sending a message to us. Work of your hands is not what I want. He wants us to offer the firstlings of the flock. In other words, ourselves. Offer ourselves as a living sacrifice of God. That's the concept. Okay. Reading on. But under Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very rough, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou rough? And why is thy countenance fallen? And if you do well, 
Listen to this. If you do well, shall I not be accepted. And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall his desire uh, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now I, I'm I know it sounds like we're labouring through this portion of scripture, but this is critical to understand. This is the concept that, that is the world's religions. That in the Amplified Version, verse 7, read this. If you do well, you will not be accept, uh, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin crouches at your door. It is, uh, its desire is for you, but you must master it. That's the Amplified Version of that verse. Now, if you can understand the, the big picture here, this concept that Cain has is that he has got to somehow, through works, be saved by being good, to be acceptable to God. And God is trying to hammer it home to him. It's not about that. It's about loving God. Read in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaks. He's saying this concept is still important for the New Testament. We're going to look at that a little, little bit later. This is, this is a pinnacle moment. It's referred to a lot in the New Testament. I know, look, look at your faces. You're all wondering, what's this got to do with the city? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment, because what happened from this was, Cain killed Abel, Cain got upset, he kills Abel, and then God says, off you go, and kicks him out. And Cain says unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out this day from the faith of the earth. Now, he didn't kick him off the planet. The faith of the earth was just that region where Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel lived. And from thy face I sh shall I be hid, and shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that finds me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any man finding him should kill him. Does anybody know what that means? What the mark looks like? No one, no one knows what it is. It's an interesting concept in the scriptures, this concept of this mark. In the New Testament, we read this. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is talking about us, when we're resurrected, the church resurrected to be with the Lord, is, is going to be comprised of people who have not received the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is the mark of Cain. So, yeah, that sounds like a bit of a stretch, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> it, it does, it sounds like a stretch when I just say it like that. But we'll see that as we go through. The topic of Revelation 13 right through is this struggle between Jerusalem and Babylon. What we're going to see is this religious concept of salvation of works is this mark of the beast. Okay, chapter 4, verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, now this is not the Enoch that was translated, this is a different Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. <coughs> Who knew that Cain built the first city? Did you know that? This city has been found. The actual pronunciation of the city is Uruk. We read here, a study of the cuneiform soon revealed that this could equally uh, well be pronounced Unuk, which was recognised at once by Sais, 
uh, and many others as identical with the biblical word Enoch. Because they could only speak English. So the pronunciation of the word Enoch was Enoch, which was perverted to become Uruk. So this city, which was found around about here, was a massive city. It was the first city built. Just to give you an idea of how big this city was. I just want to... Um, can you read that okay? It's a bit hard to read, I think. I think I'll just read it out to you. I can see it a little bit closer here on my computer. It says here, For thousands of years in southern Mesopotamia, which is ancient Iraq, was home to hunters, fishers, and farmers exploiting fertile soil, uh, rivers, and abundant animals. By around 3200 BC, the largest set settlement in southern Mesopotamia um, was Uruk, the true city um, dominated by monumental mud brick buildings decorated with mosaics of painted clay cones embedded in the walls and extraordinary works of art, large-scale sculptures and round relief carvings appear for the first time together with metal um, casings used in lost wax process. So it's, it's a pretty technical city, a pretty big city. It was estimated that around about 50,000 people lived there at the height of this city. This city was the first of seven cities eventually that became Babylon. So Babylon was founded by Cain. Did we all know that? Did anyone know that? It's a significant concept. And it's a complicated one. And that's part of the reason why I'm videoing this is because it's something that when you want to get into the scriptures to learn about this, it is an amazing story in scriptures. It's absolutely amazing from God's perspective. He's looking down on this earth, and mankind are going about building this city. The city is the whole earth, called Babylon. This is, means confusion. And it engulfs every religious ideology on the planet. But it began with Cain being cast out of the garden and going around to build a city. His own city that became Babylon. Okay. What happens now is that uh, in the interim, God was very unhappy with what Cain had done and destroyed the city with a flood. All of them died. The only people who survived the flood was Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. Now when God said he was going to flood the face of the earth, it's not necessarily the whole planet. That's all God said. He was going to flood the face of the earth. God, uh, when he spoke to Cain, Cain said, you cast me out, out this day from the face of the earth. Right? So the face of the earth does not necessarily mean a confined area that is with a specific boundary. It just means this area that God is dealing with. Right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that the flood came to Australia and America and in all these countries, right? It may well have just been in that one region. We don't know. I wasn't there. But after the flood, the sons of Ham, we have this, these events, and this is really interesting. Have a look at this. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty, uh, a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, before the Lord. What did we just read when the, when the archaeologists were talking about this place? The reason why this city was such an amazing place was because it was um, what it was was a massive city with massive walls where people would go out and they would hunt and bring back food and trade within the city. So you had these concepts of a city uh, a city state beginning with this city of Uru or Enoch. The flood destroys it, and then, after the flood, we see this Nimrod comes back and he rebuilds this city. We read here in verse 10. 
And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Ebek and Akkad and Kalnar and in the, in the land of Shinar. Out of the land went forth Asher and built Nineveh and the city uh, Rehoboth and Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. The same is a great city. So all of these cities, seven cities, stretched out around this Tigris and Euphrates River. Erech is the same city as, e uh, as Enoch. It's the same city rebuilt, but it's called Erech now. It's the same place. You look at any of the Bible concordances or dictionaries or whatever, Erech and Enoch are the same city. It's just rebuilt, rebuilt the same place. Time, they decide they're going to build a big tower. Now, I, I do wonder whether they're going to build this tower, thinking that if the flood comes back again, they'll be... <laughs> They'll be out of the flood. But they, they start to build this big tower. And that's where chapter 11 comes. Where they build this tower. And, well, I'll just quickly go through the chapter. And the whole earth, the whole earth was one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So there's a couple of things in this, but they wanted to make a tower and they wanted to make a name for themselves. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are as one, and they have, all have one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down there and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And the Lord scattered them from uh, abroad from thence, upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it, of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound their language, and all the earth, and from thence did the, the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So I think we need to just, I guess, reevaluate where we're at. And I did this with an image. Adam leaving the garden. Cain kills Abel and he casts out and he goes and builds his city Enoch, which becomes Unuk or Uruk. The flood comes and destroys it. Then they rebuild the city and call it Erech. Right? This was built by a descendant of Ham, whose name was Nimrod. On the other line, here the green one, we see Adam, after Cain killed Abel and Cain was cast out, they had another son named Seth. And through the line of Seth came Noah. And then eventually Shem, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, Abraham lived in Ur, which was one of the seven cities over here, in Babylon. Then he was, he was asked by God to leave the city and go and dwell in tents, where God was his protection or his provision. Are we following the story now, as we go through? This is basically the story of the early chapter of Genesis. This city, Erech, eventually became the city of Babylon. All these cities, all together, became the seven cities of Babylon. You know, originally Sydney was not just was not all of the cities around it, like Parramatta, Liverpool, all these places were not part of Sydney originally. But Sydney, as it grew, the, it, it engulfed these other townships, and they all became part of Greater Sydney. The same thing happened with Babylon. It became, all these little places became part of the monstrosity of Babylon. And in the, the dream of all the um, succession of empires in Daniel, we see that Babylon eventually was overtaken by the Medes and the Persians, and then by the Greek Empire, and eventually by the Roman Empire, and then the Roman Empire became the Byzantine Empire, and that is the foundations of our culture. So can you see the importance of the origin of Babylon in the world we live in? 
Are we seeing this? Because this is talked about throughout Scripture, about this concept of Babylon and what it represents. The world, the world's economics, the world's politics, the world's morals, the world's religions, are all part and parcel of this Babylonian religious concept, or economic concept. The whole thing is the world. And so there's only really two cities. One is the world, and one is the body of Christ. That's it. There's only two. In 476 AD, the western section of the Roman Empire ruled over ten kingdoms. In 606 AD, the Papal Rome came into existence. Pope Boniface became the first Pope. And that's the foundation of the Roman Catholic system, for example. And from there we have other religious concepts. So we, are we starting to see the, the whole concept unrolling? So going back to this list again. Can we see how Babylon, which then became Medo Persian, and each of these different kingdoms just adopted the concepts that came from there, and eventually became the Holy Roman Empire, which became Western Europe, which became America, which became Australia, which became New Zealand, which became Canada. These are all nations that all stemmed from these same places, right? And in the middle of all that, you have Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes which ultimately became America, Great Britain, Australia and these countries in the middle of all that. So geographically we've got these countries that have emanated from Abraham that has laid the foundation for the, the promises of Abraham to be eventually given to individuals that are living in this world but we're surrounded in Babylon. That's the concept of the Bible. So, we're going to look at Jerusalem now. So in the very next chapter in Genesis was chapter 11. So we've gone through chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right down to chapter 11 so far, all about the, the, the establishment of this Babylonian concept, this culture, which is based on salvation of works. Then, in chapter 12, God calls out Abraham from out of that, and says, I want you to now come over here and let me be your refuge. Live in tents. By the way, this concept that we're talking about today, the apostles knew all about this. This is evident from their writings. So this is a concept that we today, this is very foreign. I talk to people all the time, they go, they don't understand this. They have that, the concept is so foreign. But you look into the New Testament and you see it mentioned and you realise that people are Paul. They knew this concept. They knew the Old Testament. This should be the norm of having this understanding because understanding the two camps is critical in winning the war. You've got to know your enemy. The enemy isn't religions or churches. The enemy is the world. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord uh, hath said unto Abraham, of Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Which is interesting, considering that the previous chapter, these people were, who were building this big tower were trying to make a name for themselves. And God says, come out from there, and I'll make your city. I'll, I'll, I'll make your name great. And I'll give you all these things. I'll make you great. And that's where Abraham went from. And then all the way around here, down to here. Long way. A long way to travel on your own with your family, you know, going off. All because God told to do it. In the New Testament, let's have a look at what the New Testament says about this because hopefully it will make it all really clear. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as, uh, as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir, the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterwards receive for inheritance, 
obey, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Now, he didn't have a clue. He was just completely walking by faith. God just said, leave the city, and I'll show you where I'm taking you. That's why Abraham is classified as this man of faith in the Bible. Then, look down at verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So, this is the beginning of the concept of the city of Jerusalem. He's come out of the city-state of Babylon, of which Ur is one of the parts of it, and then comes out and he's going off to find a city who, that God has built. And he's living in tents. Reading on in Hebrews 11. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and, conf and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Remember what Seth's name meant? Did you read that there? Seth's name means transient. It's not accidental. All these names, all these things that happen in the Bible, they are all part of God's un unfolding for us the concept that we cannot be saved by works. That's the whole concept. Because if you examine it, if you look at all the religions of the world, it is, they are all the same in that they are all about salvation of works. You think about this. Buddhism, salvation of works. Muslims, it's all salvation of works. Roman Catholicism, a billion people, salvation of works, earning your way to God. Any religion that, that is founded on, on this concept of salvation of works is a type of what Cain was offering. Work of their hands. We're not to do that. We're to give ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's what God wants. He wants our life. Do we see that? Because I, I'm thinking that it's a, it's a very complex story when you first see it. But when you look at this over and over again, you'll see it. it's just such an amazing concept that God is showing us. Verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly if they, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. See, this is what I'm getting at. The apostles keep writing about this city. But in the Old Testament, it's not mentioned about this city. Well, it is, we're going to say that, it's mentioned in the prophets. But the guys who are walking around, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, there's no mention of this city there. But the apostles, when they're talking about this concept, they're talking about how these guys were moving towards this city that God was preparing. And then they talk about this other city called Babylon, which represents the world. So there's only ever this talk story of these two cities. One, Babylon representing the whole planet, and within that, that planet is this city of Jerusalem that God is building, stone by stone. Each person in this room is one stone in that building. You're coming together as this holy city. We are all part of it. That's what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. God is pulling us out of Babylon and putting us as parts of stones, living stones, in this building that he's building. This great city of Jerusalem. And that's what these guys are talking about. That's the understanding the apostles had. Look here, this is all through Hebrews. Because Paul here is writing to the Hebrews. So Hebrews is a real rich treasure for understanding God's, all the Old Testament concepts where it's clarified. You read the Old Testament stories, 
And it starts to all come together in the book of Hebrews because he's writing to Hebrews who knew the Old Testament, explaining to them these spiritual concepts that underpin the physical representations or characterizations in the Old Testament. That's what Hebrews is so valuable. So I love Hebrews. I read through it. Then I go back into the Old Testament stories and I'm going, oh, that's what they meant. Oh, that's what they meant. That's what's happening here. So when you read the story of Cain and Abel in the garden, or Adam and Eve in the garden, or them building the Tower of Babel and all this, they're amazing stories that are explained later. They're there as historical events, but the, each of the elements of those stories are really important because the concepts are spiritual concepts that are brought up in the New Testament and then be further developed and clarified. The Tower of Babel is amazing. You read Zephaniah, the book of Zephaniah, and you compare it to Genesis chapter 11, and you've got these two mirror stories. When I say mirror, you know when you look at the mirror and it's the opposite? In the story of Zephaniah, God is talking about this great city he's building, right? That he's making, an, he's going to make a name for us in this great city, and it's going to be uh, this, this tower that's going to reach up, and, we're, and the way that we're going to be coming into it is he's going to give us a new language. And it's the exact opposite to what happened at the Tower of Abel, where he destroyed that. And they gave them all different languages. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. We do understand this is not a physical city we're talking about. We're talking about a spiritual concept. Sam's almost asleep. Up all night, playing video games. Um, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, Guess what the Old Testament name for firstborn is? First, what, what did Cain offer? Of the fruit of his hands? What did Abel offer? Of the firstlings of his flock. The same concept. Which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better, speaks better things than that of Abel. So straight away Paul, talking about this, then just puts a little big full stop on the back of it and says, we're talking about the story of Abel here, folks. Do you see the link? Because the whole concept that you save by works is always trying to beat its way into the church. As each succeeding generation goes on, more and more we start to get confused and we start to think that we are pleasing to God by our works. And our own pride builds that. Because we start to compare ourselves amongst ourselves or we start to say we're a little bit better than the bloke down the street. We start to think how righteous we are and how holy we are and we start to think we're something special. Don't we? That's what happens. And over the generations, what happens is people come into the church. You know, um, I'm not going to turn to it, but one of my favourite scriptures is in Romans chapter 10, where God is talking through, through, um, through Paul, who's writing to the church of Rome. And he says these amazing words. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And they going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness which is of God. This is exactly what comes into the church. Time, I've seen it over the last 20 years so many times. And we've got to make sure that we protect ourselves from that. We are not saved because we're all a bunch of really holy little Christians here. We're saved because Jesus died for us. Jesus is the only one who's lived a righteous life. We are not saved by virtue of us being somehow really holy people. We're saved by grace. And that concept coming into the church, that we are trying to establish our own righteousness by the works of our hands, is going back to doing exactly what Cain did, offering the works of our hands. And we're falling victim to this concept, this Babylonian concept of salvation of works. Let me go on to chapter 13 of Hebrews. 
For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That's what God wants. Just praise the Lord. Sin won't be a problem. The world won't be a problem. Ethical humanism won't be a problem. Temptation, lust, the sins of the flesh, these sorts of things will not be a problem if we are just wanting to serve the Lord. Because we don't want what's in this world. We want what's coming. And what's coming is massive. It's massive. Any kick of the clock. We've got to get that vision. This physical body is temporary. It's transient. There's something coming on this earth that is huge. And that's what these guys are envisaging. That's why they keep talking about this city that God is building. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. That's what God wants. He wants us, our praise. If you're sick, praise the Lord. I do it all day. Like I, I'm funny at work. Uh, my, my view on the, the meetings is we come to meetings, we have choruses, we have a talk, and we have spiritual gifts, yeah? I believe that that is designed to make us strong in the Lord. Right? So when I go to work, I listen to talks, I listen to choruses, and I praise. I pray to the Lord all, all day at work in my office. People walk past my office and I'm sitting there and I'm praying away and people, you know, you know I'm, I'm not being overt about it. I'm, I'm not sort of walking around praying or being silly about it. But, you know, like you, you want to be in your closet, you know, you want to be reserved, you, want, you don't want to be a mental person. But that formula of prayer, of listening to the talks, prayer, listening to the talks, praising the Lord, singing choruses, will make you so strong, and just so strong, that nothing will bother you. Nothing will bring you down. Because God has given us that. These are the weapons of our world warfare. It makes you into a really good soldier. So if you're a person who spends time praising the Lord, you know, five minutes of prayer, you might not pray at all. If you're praying five minutes a day, I've got news for you. When the Lord returns, you're going to go through a big disappointment. Huge disappointment. The apostles said, if, 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 if they're not resurrected, then they are of all men most miserable. Get serious about it. Take it seriously. This is your life. You know, it's, it's your life. We can get caught up with all of the Babylonian stuff that they just want to keep throwing at us to occupy our minds, to amuse us. Or we can just take it seriously and praise the Lord. Give it our everything. Live life like this is your last week. If this is your last week to live, what would you do? What would, how would you spend it? If you had one week to live, would you spend it making sure that your eternity is assured? Or would you spend it playing video games and watching movies? You know, I've watched plenty of movies, don't worry. <laughs> I bought about eight of them yesterday. But we, we, I'm not saying be this religious fanatic. What I'm saying is, is have your priorities right. Be about your father's business. Have your head screwed on. Think about a thousand years from now, ten thousand years from now, a hundred thousand years from now. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be a distant memory? Or do you want to be still around, moving on to whatever God has got in the future? Do we believe in God? Do we really believe that there is such thing as God? Do we? We all say it. I believe we believe in God. But if we're serious about this, this is a God who created the universe. Do you think it's all just going to come to a big crashing halt? <laughs> or in a million years, will there still be stuff happening? Will we be involved in it? Do we want to be involved in it? These decisions come down to the sacrifices. Cain offered a sacrifice that, I don't know how sincere he was. I don't know whether Cain just thought, well, why aren't you happy with this? He may have given the best of the fruit of the vine, the best of his work. He probably worked twice as hard as Abel for his sacrifice, but it wasn't what God wanted. We've got laid out for us exactly what God wants. So let's take hold of it. Now, Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62 is amazing, an amazing prophecy. 
I just want to read these verses to you because this understanding that the apostles had about this city, this is one of the key verses, I think, if they were asked, what are you talking about, Paul? What are you talking about, Peter, about this city? Read this. For Zion's sake will I not, uh, will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as the brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. This is in the closing chapters of Isaiah. Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. And he's talking about Jerusalem in a very different light here. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name. He's not talking about the physical Jerusalem here. He's talking about a spiritual concept. Which the mouth of the Lord shall name, and thou shalt be, shall be also, uh, shall also be a crown of glory in the land, in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be uh, termed desolate. This is before the city is even destroyed, and he's saying now about the physical city being destroyed. But he's talking about a spiritual city here. <coughs> Thou shalt be called by, uh, shall be called, he, uh, I can't even say the word, Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delights in thee, and thy land shall be married, and thy land shall be married, it's amazing words, thy land shall be married, for as a young man marries a virgin, shall, shall so shall thy sons marry thee, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. He's talking about Jerusalem now, as God's bride. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. You shall make mention of the Lord, uh, and keep not silence. And give him no rest till he establish, and he will make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. This is a prophecy concerning us. It's about the church. What we read earlier. The city of the firstborn. The general assembly of the church. Of the body of Christ. That's what it's talking about. These scriptures. About the, and we call the bride. We talk about giving us a new name. How do I know that? Read Revelation 21. This is when it's all said and done. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We start to see the picture when the Lord returns. When the Lord returns. We've talked about this many times, haven't we? The Lord comes back. We rise up to meet him in the air. Right? Then we come back to rule and reign for a thousand years. Right? And here, it's talking about us, this whole church of the firstborn, as being this city that we've described as this city, this new Jerusalem, this city of peace, of unity, oneness in spirit. We are a living city, an edifice. It's what God's building. Let's read on. And there shall... And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to that great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Is it a physical city, do you think? No. It's a spiritual concept. Having the glory of God, and her light was upon, uh, like unto the stone of most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Clear as crystal. I won't get too much into the jasper stone, but each of the twelve tribes had a stone that represented each of the twelve stones, right? Each of the twelve tribes. And the word, the, the, the tribe that was the firstborn of all of the tribes of Israel was Reuben. Now Reuben, his stone was jasper. And Reuben means, behold a son. Behold I have a son. That's what it means. Reuben, Reuben was born in the firstborn, and his name was, he was called Reuben, and his name meant Behold the Son. So when it talks about the Jasper Stone, it's really referring to the first, the church of the firstborn, the first son. Us. 
Do we say it? Jesus and us, co heirs together of everything. Everything in the scriptures is meaningful. Every job and tittle. And if you dig down deep enough into the scriptures, it's all there. It's amazing. Now, compare what we just read about the city coming down, the church of the firstborn, right? Us. Then we read back in Revelation, a letter to the, to the church of Philadelphia. It says, Behold, I come quickly, and hold fast to that which thou hast, and that no man take thy crown. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which come down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. What did we read back in the story in Isaiah 62? He's going to give us a new name. The city of Jerusalem is going to be our name. The city of peace. This is our name. And then here, in the letter to the church, he says here in verse 13, He that has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What's the church? The church is the body of Christ. And what he's saying to the body of Christ here is, He'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from my God. I'll write upon him my new name. Clear as crystal, isn't it? The church is Jerusalem. Yep. Two more slides to go, so we're almost there. I know it's a long time, but I want to really portray the concept here of how special it is what we have. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. Now, saints is anybody who's filled with the Holy Spirit. Saints just means a separated one. So if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're a saint. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all are building fitly framed together, grows unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So we are baptised by the Spirit into this temple, this holy temple, this great city structure that God is building. Made up of people from every country in the world who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Through the Spirit. Not through religious indoctrination, not by calling yourself this name or this name, or I'm a Catholic, or I'm a Church of England, or I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Muslim, or a Buddhist, or whatever. It makes no difference. They are all just different versions of the Babylonian religion. It is, there's only one church on this earth that is spirit-filled people. That is it. Everyone else has the mark of the world or the mark of the beast. It's a lot of people. That's why Jesus said, why is the road that leads to destruction and many there be that go thereat? But narrow is the way that leads to life. Very few people will be in this city of Jerusalem. For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For we groan, uh, sorry, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that we being clothed, we shall not be found naked. So, from start to finish, in this story we look at today, from the moment that God came down to Adam and Eve in the garden, once she had eaten of the fruit, of the knowledge of good and evil, and determined within herself that she can make the distinction between good and evil, God said to her, no, you can't. They said about to give themselves a covering to repair the problem, and it was not acceptable. He gave them a new covering. And all of these religious concepts in the world are all setting about to cover their sins because everybody wants to be, go to heaven, don't they? Everybody wants to go to heaven, don't they? Everybody else. Nobody wants, I don't know anybody who wants to go to heaven. People might say it. I've heard Vikings say they want to go to heaven. <laughs> but it's not true. When push comes to shove, if I put a gun to your head, cock back the hammer, and I'm about to pull the trigger, 
You're not thinking about the footy. You're not thinking about anything but where you're going next. Everybody wants to go to heaven. We have been clothed in the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible talks about. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible talks about it being like a garment for the wedding feast. In when Jesus spoke about the wedding feast, what did he say? When people, a guy came into the wedding feast, he didn't have the garment on, the robe of righteousness that came from him, and he was thrown out. No, you can't come into the wedding. You haven't got the right clothes on. The clothing is Jesus. We are clothed by his grace, clothed in his glory. You look into it, actually. Before Adam and Eve um, ate of the fruit, they were clothed in the glory of God. Everything was created with covering, including Adam and Eve. They were given a covering. They were covered in the glory and the brightness of God. That changed after the cast out the garden, by the way. So, in summary, what we see today is Adam Cain built the first city. That city became a city concept of salvation and works that eventually became Babylon. It was overtaken by the Medes and the Persians was spread even bigger by Greece. Greece brought in their philosophy and their culture. The Greek culture has so underpinned our Western European culture. You have no idea the influence of the Greek culture on our culture here today, 2,000 years later. We still uh, uh, have the influence of the Greek culture. That's another story. Rome became the greatest empire on the face of the earth at that stage. And then from that, the Holy Roman Empire, 1260 years the Holy Roman Empire reigned, influenced kings all over the Europe. When they came to the New World, in the 1400s, right? The most powerful nation at that time, the 1400s, was the Holy Roman Empire. Then, from here you see, from Adam to Seth to Noah, Shem, Shem had three sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. So Shem, sorry, Noah had three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. From Ham, we've got Nimrod, who came over here and rebuilt this city. Japheth, uh, his descendants moved into the northern parts of Russia. So if you go to Russia and in Russian schools, they teach in their schools that they are, they are Japhetic. They, the, the people like Askenaz, who was the son of Japheth, go, you go right back in Russian history, they talk about they are from Askenaz. The Jews in Russia are called Askenazi Jews. From Shem came Abraham. A Abraham had a married uh, with his wife Sarah. She bore Isaac, to whom God gave promises that they were going to be an incredible nation, that they were spread around, that eventually the Messiah would be born through his descendants. But also, he had a brother um, named Ishmael. And Ishmael, from Ishmael came Muhammad. Now Muhammad was a direct line to, to um, Ishmael, according to the Quran. So therefore, the Muslims believe that the birthright of the promises of God come from Abraham to Hagar to sorry, from Abraham to Ishmael to Muhammad and down. They believe that he is the Messiah for their religion to life. The prophet. Isaac here, after the nation of Israel destroyed, one of the tribes that came down through here became the Buddhists. Buddha came from the tribe that had, uh, if you look in the history books of Buddha, where his family came from, they weren't, they weren't born there. The Buddha's family migrated there from around Israel in about, about 580 odd BC, a few years after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. It's all in there in the history books. So this whole concept is our planet we live on. And it's all Babylonian if, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? These nations here were blessed by God to create an environment in which the church would prosper, to care for it. The Old Testament was like a plough that went forward and ploughed up the ground so that when the when the Messiah came and the seed came, the, the plant would grow. It's a concept of a vineyard. Uh, another story in scripture. But that's what it's 
function was. So God blessed Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these nations here. They migrated across into Great Britain and then spread abroad to the Commonwealth and all these countries, taking with them the common law, the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, freedom, liberty, an environment where the church can grow, freedom of religion and all this. It's all done by God to prepare the ground so the church could be nurtured in that environment. It doesn't save them because these countries are still, if they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, they are part of Babylon. And they reap the reward for that. But God still creates an environment. God rose up Babylon as far as Nebuchadnezzar in the city of Babylon. And he blessed people. Cyrus was blessed of God. All to do his purpose. To provide and nurture God's people who were embedded in them. Not to say that these people are going to live forever. I don't expect Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in heaven. Right? But God blessed Nebuchadnezzar and used him in order to nurture the Jews while they were in, in um, Babylon. God blessed Cyrus to take the city and other people in the, in the Persian Empire just to nurture them so that God could use them and use people that were in that city to eventually rebuild the city of Jerusalem and so on, so that the Messiah could, be, could come and be born there. So it's no mystery that God, the world is his footstool. He does what he likes. But ultimately, we are the end result of it. Okay? That might be about it.